Holy Usopp, what a perfectly juicy chapter to leave us with for the upcoming four week hunger streak. Buddha Sensei really gave us a ton of meat to chew on while we wait for the story to continue. And thank God we didn't actually end up rushing out of Wano within two chapters, but we will get some more time to wrap things up properly. Let's begin right away with the new bounties we've gotten. Luffy, Law, and Kit all have received an absolutely ridiculous bounty of 3 billion berries, making all three of them more wanted than Blackbeard's. I think this bounty reveal is a big surprise in a number of ways. I'm sure there are many people who expected it to be a lot higher than this, including me honestly, but really, I love 3 billion for a number of reasons. When you really think about it, it makes a ton of sense really. Putting Luffy above Blackbeard underlines really nicely how impactful his victory over Kaido really was. Yes, Blackbeard killing off Whitebeard and taking his devil fruit shook the world, no pun intended actually, but Whitebeard was sick, old, and had already been fighting against the strongest fighters in the Marines. Luffy, meanwhile, was facing off against a significantly younger Kaido, still in his prime and known as the most powerful creature in the entire world. And yes, I know Kaido was also fighting against the Scabbards, Yamato, and five of the Supernova at once, but in the end, if we're really being honest, Luffy was really the one who did over 90% of the damage it took to really take him down. So in other words, a bounty higher than Teach makes sense. Now, you could argue that Luffy deserves a bounty higher than Kaido, for taking him down. For example, instead of Kaido's 4 billion, the much quoted 5.6 billion. Gomu, in line with Luffy's Gomu Gomu no Mi, only that we now know that there actually is no Gomu Gomu no Mi at all. So I think that this particular wordplay might well be off the table for now. The fact that taking down both Kaido and Big Mom did take a major team effort in the end, in my opinion, justifies a lower bounty than them. Again, just because Teach took out Whitebeard didn't mean that he got a 6 billion berry bounty afterwards. I know that Luffy usually got a higher bounty than his opponent because he took them out at full strength. Antagonists like Katakuri, for instance, started at full health against Luffy, so raising his bounty higher than theirs did make sense, at least from an outside perspective. I mean, Morgan and the government didn't really know what was going on in the mirror world after all. However, CP0 was reporting every last detail about the raid to the outside world. And so as a result, the bounty could be adapted a lot more precisely. On top of that, putting Luffy above Kaido's level would also have put him above Shanks, who has been a Yonko for much, much longer than Luffy, who just turned a Yonko today. And so I would assume that you would have to repeatedly do crazy stuff like this to actually raise your bounty even higher, even as a Yonko. Who knows, maybe Luffy will overtake Shanks after they have actually met in the story, which would would make a lot more sense narratively as well, I think. Then of course, the 3 billion berry bounty fits in incredibly nicely with Luffy's path so far. He went from 30 million, kind of rookie bounty, to a 300 million warlord level bounty to 1.5 billion after defeating Karakuri, in other words, half a Yonko bounty, and now has officially entered the Yonko realm, completing the three series with 3 billion berries on his flaming head. Then of course, there's the question, why both Kit and Law have gotten the same bounty as Luffy? Rightfully, you might say that Luffy is the most powerful out of these three. Now, I was honestly pretty pretty surprised myself about this reveal as well. However, I really like it, honestly. Similarly to Luffy, both Law and Kit deserve pretty much 90% of the credit for taking down Big Mom. And I think that the world government in the end valued the act of taking down a Yonko here and not just power scale everyone. Instead of splitting Luffy's bounty and giving Law and Kit 1.5 billion berries each, they were looking at the alliance of these three pirate captains as a whole and want to see all three of them captured for the threat they now pose equally. It also really nicely and honestly unexpectedly sets up Law and Kit as true rivals to Luffy for finding the One Piece now. In a way, it suddenly gives them a lot more relevance for the remaining story than I would originally have suspected. Plus, it gives Luffy the chance to distinguish himself from the two even more in the future. Which is a really important point too, I think, that I'm really pretty excited about. 
Giving Luffy a mid-range Yonko bounty strongly suggests to me that we will see at least one more bounty poster for him at some point in the story, reaching the true pinnacle of the One Piece worlds. You have to remember that Luffy defeating the world government will mean no more wanted posters for obvious reasons. And so I speculated before that Wano might well be the last increase we will see for all the Straw Hats. But no, with, with this number, it really looks like we'll get at least one more, maybe after Elbaf, or maybe even after Luffy becomes the new Pirate King, just like Roger did. Now, in case you're still salty about Luffy having the same bounty as Kid in law, I want to remind you that the world government is very much aware of Luffy being the strongest out of all these three. Don't forget how much they really fear the return of Sun God Mika. And so I think they decided to not put that into his bounty, but instead gave Luffy one of the new two open spots among the four emperors. While Law and Kid, on the other hand, don't get that title. Luffy becoming a Yonko is what really distinguishes him from the other two now. And if you don't believe me, just look at Kid's reaction this chapter. He thinks exactly the same way. Now, of course, he's just joking, I think, when he says that he now has come for Luffy's head but he very much understands that the government does see Luffy above him and Law. So overall, I do genuinely believe that the new bounties are pretty much perfect, especially with Luffy now being officially an emperor and a Yonko. I actually really enjoyed that we only got these three bounties and the new Yonko reveal this chapter. Don't worry, we will get to Buggy. But yeah, the fact that all the Straw Hats have got new bounties, but we will only be getting those after the break is pretty dope, I think. Because I mean, that basically guarantees that we will have a banger chapter right away after the break, and it also gives Oda like an extra 50% breathing time, because I'm pretty sure that 1054 will at least be like 50% bounty posters. Now, sadly enough, that won't include my own wanted poster, even though my own bounty has just recently also been raised from 95 million, that would be nice, 59 million to 60 million, after we hit 600,000 subscribers on the channel last week, because every single subscriber equals 100 berries on top of my bounty. Honestly, thank you so much for the support, it means the world, especially since we have been at war with this man here, Treble, who still is almost 40 million berries ahead of us, but we're coming for you, Travel. We'll show you who's boss in the end. Anyways, what I once again found super interesting is how big news Morgan is once again disobeying the government censorship. Will that get me in trouble on YouTube for saying that? Oh, whatever. While he got the official bounties and the Yonko news from the Gorosei, he decided to print an image of Luffy in Gear 5 on his wanted poster, basically publishing Luffy's new godly appearance to the entire world. A photo that CP0, by the way, managed to take during the fight. I guess in an effort to not let Cylinder Guy's death not be in vain, maybe? Anyways, understandably, the Gorosei are furious about this leak. The government has tried to erase the true nature of the Nika fruit from history for centuries, and now its awakened form will be seen in every single corner of the entire world. That is especially concerning because there are people out there who will know exactly what the they're looking at. I'm thinking Shanks, Rayleigh, maybe also Blackbeard or Dragon. In other words, having some of the most powerful and dangerous people in the world find out that Joy Boy has finally returned that will make things even more unstable for the government than things already were. I actually also found it hilarious that apparently the CP agents were taken out by Big Mom's ship in particular. Hilarious because they were completely useless and absent for the entirety of the raid, but also because it still makes me wonder whether Big Mom and Kaido might not have survived falling in a volcano somehow in the end. And even if they didn't, it also raises the question what the Big Mom pirates will do now that their leader has been taken out. The Beast pirates have all pretty much been decimated after the raid, especially with Green Bull's arrival. 
but the Big Mom Pirates are basically still fully functional in full force. So will Katakuri become a new captain? And how will he react to Big Mom just having been defeated? Will he try to avenge her or join forces with Luffy maybe? For some reason, I haven't really thought about this before at all, but now I'm really super, super curious. Uh, yeah, and uh, speaking of Green Bull, what the hell just happened there? It seems like King and Queen tried to fight him and got completely decimated because Green Bull, or Aramaki as he's called, is an absolute monster. It turns out that he doesn't just use his plant powers for photosynthesis to survive, but instead he literally sucks the life force out of his opponents to heal himself. This devil fruit, whatever it exactly is, might be one of the, if not the, most terrifying power I've honestly seen in the entirety of the story. Like, just imagine what you could do with this. You could build entire cities if you wanted to. It's basically the One Piece version of Hashirama, if you like. His abilities are basically perfect to take out large amounts of medium strong opponents all at once. An incredibly precise yet wide range attack. And on top of that, he also seems to be a swordsman, just like Isho, carrying what looks to be a black blade, if I'm not mistaken. So this once again makes me wonder, of course, if he's not actually someone from Wano. Now something else that might hint towards that is his real life inspiration that people on the internet were once again pretty quick to find out. As you probably know, all admirals in the story are inspired by Japanese actors, and Green Bull is no exception. He's the spitting image of Yoshio Harada, a super famous Japanese actor who was especially known for two types of roles, rebels and samurai, sometimes both. We can see the rebel in him for constantly disobeying Akainu's orders, and the samurai once again might hint at a connection to Wano that I do really would like to see for some reason. Now, I originally speculated that he might actually be a good guy who, similarly to Aokiji or maybe Fujitora, will actually sympathize with Luffy's cause. However, after seeing just how brutal he is and how good he finds Akainu's extreme way of doing things, I'm not so sure anymore, honestly. He literally says he's coming for Luffy's head. Now, he might still turn out to be a good guy, or Zoro's father, but it doesn't really seem like it. Though, honestly, he can be both Zoro's father and a bad guy at the same time, I guess. I have a lot more thoughts about Green Bull, but I'll save all of that for a whole video on him during the break. Meanwhile, we have the major celebration going on in the flower capital, basically seeing the start of the big banquet we've all been waiting for. The best thing about this really is how it shows us just how much Luffy has grown throughout Wano and the New World really, while still being the very same person at heart that we first fell in love with. He doesn't want to take away from Momo's big moment and he sees all the people of Wano eating and drinking for free as much as they like. Basically, a mini version of his dream that we got just revealed a few chapters ago. A world where all his friends can eat and drink as much as they like. I don't know about you, but to me it just seems like becoming a Yonko and beating Kaido has made Luffy a little bit wiser, as weird as it may sound in regards to Luffy. But for some crazy reason, there is even more to this chapter, and it's so short also the heck, because in the secret basement with the dolls, that sounds weird, that we already had seen before, Robin, who I'm happy to see has not been captured by anyone yet, has a conversation with Hitetsu, one of the first characters we actually ever met in Wano. Well, it turns out that uh, this man is actually Kozuki Sukiyaki, Odin's father who we all had thought to be dead for a long, long time. This is such an interesting reveal because it opens up so many questions. But since we barely get any answers here, I want to move on for the moment and talk about Luton. Robin, what the heck? Like, how did you know about Pluton being in Wano since Alabasta and never thought about mentioning it at least once? Not only does this once again underline the fact that Alabasta seems to have been allied with the ancient kingdom in some way or form, in this case specifically Wano, but it also begs the important, very important question, what is Pluton really? Is it a giant battleship that is hidden somewhere in Wano? Or is it literally Momonosuke, just how it was Shirahoshi? 
Yoshi on Fishman Island. I really do feel like I have a hunch that we might be getting some more lore on the ancient weapons in the story quite soon with this reveal. But now let's move on to my personal and I guess your personal highlight of the entire chapter. Uh, this right here. Who would have thought that the cover of volume 25 would foreshadow the future four emperors of the sea for the 25th anniversary of One Piece? Like really Oda Sensei? Just how much did you actually plan the story in advance? Is this an actual coincidence? I, I really can't tell anymore at this point. Well, Buggy becoming an emperor of the sea. Buggy becoming an emperor of the sea is just the biggest plot twist ever. It just throws up so many questions. Like, how did that happen? Is Buggy actually just lucky all through the way? Or is he actually a secret mastermind that has been pretending all along? Was Buggy the pirate that Shanks was talking about to the Gorosei to distract him from Luffy? I want to take my time and discuss this in a whole video. But for now, if you really want to understand how the world government thinks and functions and how the Gorosei have ruled the world, you should really not miss out on this video right here.